Um, the crossbenchers have also been fortunate to have the opportunity to realise our own initiatives. For instance, my private members bill, giving greater protection to journalists and their sources, was just the 18th private members bill to become law since Federation. Um, and since my 18th, um, um, uh, my colleague Rob, Rob Oakshot has got the 19th up. So that's remarkable, isn't it? There have been 19 private members bill become laws of the land since 1901, and two of them have occurred in the last 13 months as a direct result of this hung parliament. Evidence, I'm sure, of how this is a richer parliament than what happens normally where one party or one coalition of parties has a clear monopoly of power. And you know, the only reason the tax forum occurred this week is because the conduct of such a forum uh, was a condition of uh, support by uh, Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor. That is the only reason that forum occurred yesterday and the day before, which I attended, and can I add, it was not a talk fest, it actually ended up being a very, very worthwhile exercise. So full marks to particularly Rob Oakeshott who drove that. Um, moreover, the move to put a price on carbon is probably the best example of the way in which a power-sharing parliament allows for unexpected initiatives to bubble up. In my opinion, Julie Gillard was genuine before the election, before the election, when she said there'd be no carbon tax under a government she leads. But of course, no one expected the remarkable result at last year's federal election. Um, and I do believe that she felt her hand had genuinely been forced. Um, a move which I'm tickled, pick, tick, tickled pink about, because I'm sure you're all aware that I'm a strong, uh, I've long been a strong advocate for putting a price on carbon. Um, I would add that the senior political leaders who continue to call Julia Gillard a liar over this know that her hand was forced, know that she made that comment before the election in good faith, and I would actually accuse those who call Julia Gillard of being a liar, I would accuse them of in fact knowingly trying to mislead people. Um, of course there's no shortage of people in Australia, and I think most of them vote for the coalition, uh, who think the crossbenchers have too much power and would single out my poker machine reforms um, as evidence of a disproportionate amount of power being in the hands of one member of parliament. But the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, um, that many of the critics of the crossbenchers are just people still mad as hell that we decided to support Julia Gillard and not Tony Abbott. In other words, if we'd all helped to install Tony in the lodge, these same people would be very happy with the hung parliament, while, again, I say a whole new group of this time Labor Party supporters would be beating us up. And as far as poker machine reform goes, I suggest that the progress of this initiative should be seen as a triumph for democracy, not a failure, because the reform has overwhelming public support and not one party has a clear ma political majority to stop it in response to the power of vested interests. I should quickly add, of course, that the crossbenchers certainly don't get everything our way. Um, the most disappointing example for me being my ill-fated um, live animal export bill, uh, which uh, would have banned the uh, export of Australian livestock in three years' time and in the interim put in place appropriate safeguards. As you know, it was voted down by both the government and the coalition in a staggering triumph of vested interests over morality. What I can say tonight um, is that uh, I believe I've now given the Labor caucus more than enough time to address this issue, and I will be giving formal notice next week, which is a sitting week, that I'll be um, uh, formal notice of a new private member's bill which would legislate the safeguards which must be put in place before Australian livestock can be processed overseas. And my list will specifically include stunning. And I think that will be a very, very difficult private members bill for the government to deal with because it will have very strong support um, among the Labor backbench. So I hold out uh, some hope that while I failed last time, uh, I can at least uh, succeed this time. Um, the coalition also gets in the act sometimes in a positive way. For example, um, they moved a motion to establish a committee to look into Australia's mandatory detention regime. Uh, and that was in fact supported by the Green, Adam Bant and myself. And that is why we currently do have 
a, a parliamentary inquiry into Australia's mandatory detention arrangements. Moved by the coalition uh, on, the, on the right, uh, supported by Bant and Wilkie on the left, um, and cornered the government nicely in the Senate. Um, but that's the richness of it. And it's a richness, which I'll, I'll make a comment on later, which we are not seeing in the Tasmanian parliament where there is the possibility for such uh, remarkable outcomes. So has politics, at least at the federal level, failed us? On balance, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think so. I think last year's election, a federal election, was conducted to a high standard of probity. In fact, as high a standard as you would see in any country in the world. The country then ran smoothly. For the 17 days, it was without a formal government. There was no violence. There was no bloodshed. The country ran smoothly. The bureaucracy did its job. The caretaker provisions worked effectively. And I think that's something we should be very, very proud about because there are very few countries in the world where you can have a 17-day hiatus like that and everything runs so safely and smoothly. And at the end of it, a stable, productive government was formed, which has gone about its uh, business, including a dizzying, dizzying array um, of reforms, including pricing carbon, putting a, uh, a mining tax in place, poker machine and probably aged care reforms, the establishment of a uh, genuinely nation-changing national disability insurance scheme, the list goes on. Um, I tell you what, if this government can pull off half of its reform agenda, it will go down in history as one of the great reformist governments. And I'll be proud to say I was a member of a great reformist parliament. Now, none of that is to say things are going swimmingly all the time in Canberra. <laughs> Obviously it isn't. Um, while I probably tend to see everything as normal in Canberra, because I know of nothing else, so obviously every time I see something for the first time I assume it's normal, it's only when I look around at the, at the looks on the faces of my parliamentary colleagues that I realise things are far from normal. Um, uh, even I can see, though, that the environment in Canberra at the moment is absolutely toxic. Attacks are personal and just about everything coming from the opposition is destructively negative. There is no sense of goodwill about the House, uh, nor much interest in cooperation in any form. Tony Abbott in particular has proven to be remarkably capable of tapping into some of the most worrying fault lines in the community. One result being the disgusting letters and emails that crucial members of parliament are receiving, myself included obviously, some of which are warranting Australian Federal Police intervention. Uh, people who have been there before tell me they have never seen it so toxic and they have never heard of such a, a disgusting stream of emails, letters, telephone threats and so on. There, there has been something very nasty whipped up in the Australian community uh, and it is quite unfamiliar to people who have been uh, to do with the Parliament before this. And I think what the opposition have done in this regard is a complete and utter betrayal of the whole idea of a power-sharing parliament, which should be and needs to be cooperative in nature if the public interest is to be properly served. Instead, we have this confrontational dynamic which jars with the power-sharing and which is fundamentally at odds with what the public interest needs right now. We need people to just settle it down. Um, I should be careful saying well, we need Kevin Rudd and his becks on his little lie down, but I'm not advocating for Kevin Rudd to take over that. Um, don't misread that. Um, uh, what does seem to be going on at the moment is serving the coalition's political self-interest, although bizarrely not Tony Abbott's personal popularity. And I think it's, uh, I'm sure you'd agree, it's a remarkable situation where we have uh, an opposition with polling numbers at, at, at dizzying heights, but yet the leader of the opposition so relatively unpopular. Of course, the problem, one of the problems we've got in Canberra at the moment is Julie Gillard's um, uh, baggage. Um, I do think there are many Australians who are still uncomfortable, myself included, who are still in, uncomfortable with the way she came to power. It's not the way we do things in this country. Uh, and I certainly would not want to see 
a repeat of that. There is that perception I've already referred to in some circles that Julia Gillard lied about the carbon tax, a perception which I do not share. I do believe she said what she said before the election in good faith. And there is also the, the uh, or there are also the inevitable problems with big programs being rolled out very quickly, necessarily I would add, because of the need to get stimulus spending into the economy and, and you know, much publicity of problems, but, uh, obviously with the home insulation program and the building the education revolution uh, uh, program, particularly on the mainland. You know, the, Julia Gillard is carrying a fair bit of baggage and it's making it very hard for her to get any uh, clear air. Um, again, I think this helps to explain uh, why, the why the coalition is travelling so well. Although, um, I would add though, um, uh, you know, much of the, of the unique current circumstances I do think will pass with the next election or a change in political leadership because so much of it at the moment is to do with personalities. And for example, if Malcolm Turnbull was to replace Tony Abbott as the opposition leader, that would be a genuine game changer in Canberra. And it would, I think, uh, significantly influence many of the crossbenchers. Um, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are living at the moment in Canberra in unique circumstances, which will almost certainly disappear come the next election. If only because any sort of cultural change that you might think is being started at the moment in Canberra, it needs more time than a single uh, than a single term of three years for that cultural change really to, uh, you know, to, to mature. Um, before I leave Canberra, I just want to say though, there are some very, very well rehearsed, or some, 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 some issues I have that I've seen in Canberra, which I'm sure are very familiar to you, and I do think they ultimately need, need to be addressed. Um, for a start, the length of the parliamentary term. Three years is simply too short um, if only because a disproportionate amount of the three-year parliamentary term is taken up with campaigning. And in this remarkable parliament, um, Tony Abbott has been in campaign mode from the, well, from the day after the Gillard government was, uh, was formed. Um, I do think in Canberra we should move to uh, four-year terms, and I do think in Canberra we should move to fixed dates, which is what uh, Tasmania has supposedly moved to, to take away the opportunity uh, for incumbent governments to be mischievous with the way they time their elections. I do think also in Canberra there is much work still to be done on the perennial issue of political donations. Because let's face it, no one hands over a large sum of money to a political party or to a politician without also holding out some hope of a political favour at one point in the future. To suggest that a large, uh, a, a wealthy individual or a large company hands over many tens of thousands of dollars just as an act of generosity, we're kidding ourselves. I think it is little different. It is little different to a paper bag of cash being handed over in a, in a developing country. And I would like to see a significant reform of the whole political donations arrangements. And then there is the dreadful state of political party. Now I've got to warn you here: no one's going to get out of this without me throwing a rock at them. I do think that none of the political parties are genuinely democratic, including the Greens, which should be the exemplar of grassroots democracy. Um, I think the Democrats, when they were ascendant, uh, did stay true to their democratic model better than most. And I do acknowledge that within the Greens, some parts of the Greens are much better than others. Something I observed personally when I was a member of the Greens, where I was originally in the Greens in New South Wales, which was true to its grassroots democratic principles to the point of almost being unworkable, and then moved to Tasmania, where I thought um, too often decisions were made by the, the uh, senior officials or, or activists within the party, and sometimes uh, the grassroots members weren't being heard enough or weren't being involved enough. 